Hello, good morning and, and welcome everybody. Uh, gosh, it's really good to have you with us again this morning. Um, goodness knows you must be having such busy weeks um, as we all are in, in various different ways. And um, I think today is going to be a really hopeful and happy discussion because of the special guests that we have joining us. And we've entitled it a curriculum of hope. And uh, gosh, it isn't that appropriate at the moment. And I think teachers and school leaders are absolutely the deliverers of hope. It is absolutely part of their job and it's what they do so very, very well. And we have a really experienced teacher um, joining us today, author, speaker, and a contributing author on the Pathway Programme. So um, throughout this discussion, you may hear us mention the word Pathway. And for those of you who have not yet uh, encountered it, it's a new personal and professional development programme from the NAHT and Discovery Education. And it's now finished, it's made, it's done. And we're absolutely thrilled that it's cooked and it's ready. Uh, and it's available um, to school leaders and teachers all over the country. It's available now, and you can find out much more about it and even order it if you wish on the Discovery Education website. You'll see at the bottom of the screen there, slash pathway, and join the discussion on social media. We've had lots of different discussions, uh, lots of different posts and things from a great many different people, and including a lot of authors on the Pathway program uh, over the last few weeks and months, and we tend to hashtag the whole teacher. And there's been some really interesting, insightful discussions about how we support the whole teacher, by which I mean not just from the neck upwards, not just their professional skills, their professional capital, but also their well-being, their motivation, their ambition, and so forth, all of which are just as important, if not more so, especially at the moment. And today, I think, is about that. Today is about hope. So I can't wait to introduce our special guest today. So I've had the real privilege of working with Deborah on her course that she's contributed to the Pathway program. Deborah, it's great to see you there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lovely really to good to have you with us. And um, it actually looks like you've got a bit of sunshine there. Which is very, amazing. yes, very unusually for this uh, part very of the Pennine. Well. got the sun shining this morning. Oh, well, I hope, I very much hope that you're able to uh, enjoy a little bit of the sunshine after, the, after this session, although I'm sure you'll be working all day. But thank you for sparing um, just 40 minutes with us. I know you're immensely busy and very much in demand. Um, I wondered whether if we just sort of get straight into it, if you're okay, and uh, if you could tell us, um, for those of you who, who uh, those people on the call who, who have not met you or encountered your books and speeches and things, perhaps just tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional experience to date, and perhaps the focus of the work that you have today with schools. Uh, sure, yes. Um, I, I always feel a little bit like a fraud when I'm speaking to head teachers because I've never walked in the shoes of a head teacher. Um, I, I spent most of my career in the classroom. I did. Uh, I was head of department. I was. I, I had a brief stint as as an assistant head uh, and as an AST. But I've never walked in the shoes of a head teacher. So I, I always feel a little bit like I'm. Um, you know, the imposter syndrome sort of bubbles up on my shoulder. Uh, but yes, about 27 years in total and in, in education. And I started in sixth form college, uh, moved into secondary, moved into primary, bounced across the, the sector really over those years. And with a particular focus on curriculum development. Um, so I'd say for probably about the last 16 or 17 years, that's been my main focus in the schools I've been working with to developing curriculum. And today I do that, but not as part of an employee within a particular school. I go and work with schools internationally. And that's what we do. We, we build curriculum together. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Um, really interesting work now, I should imagine, actually. And, uh, and it kind of snowballs, doesn't it? Because the more schools you work with, the more experience one gets and the more insight and wisdom you can pass on to the next school. So it's a um, fascinating role to be in. And uh, we were really thrilled to be working with you on the Pathway Program. Um, so this word curriculum then, before, actually before we get into that, just very briefly for those on the call, if you wish to, to join in the chat stream, please do. Please post your chats uh, on the chat button. We'd love to hear from you. Every time we do these webinars, we have some really, really interesting views, which we value very much from the people on the call uh, who contribute to the discussion. And also, if you'd like to pose a question for Deborah at the end, we'll make sure we uh, hopefully ring fence a few minutes at the end. So post your question on the, uh, on the Q&A button or on the chat button if you can post it for everybody that will come through to me and i'll uh, i'll post pose it to to deborah so so deborah so this word curriculum hmm. uh, i mean is it just another buzzword that's come along now because of the latest changes to the ofsted framework particularly is that why it's current I, I, I can't lie and um, say that that hasn't had a massive impact on conversations in schools right. Um, right. it's as soon as ofsted 
mention anything in a framework, it becomes an obsession within many schools. Um, so when that conversation shifted, then it was inevitable that a lot of schools were going to start thinking about this word curriculum. And I do think to an extent that was right. So I don't think that it was a, you know, a, a kind of irresponsible or a, or a, a I don't know, an, an inconsequential decision for Ofsted to use the word curriculum. I think it is right that schools need to be thinking about the quality of what they deliver to students and to be thinking more deeply about whether or not the national curriculum in itself is sufficient. It was always supposed to be a lowest common denominator. It was always supposed to be a baseline from which to build. And I think it has become the curriculum and that's been a problem. And I think Ofsted are correct to point that out. But what I would say is with anything that comes out of Ofsted, we have to be healthily sceptical. Um, we don't yeah. know if it will still be in the next framework. We don't know if it will be a fad and then disappear. Um, and we do know that Ofsted increasingly, I'd say over the past 10 years, has been used as a lever to, to control schools. Um, you know, I remember listening to a former advisor of Michael Gove at a conference back in about 2013, where he said they'd realised that more than pay and incentives, Ofsted was the lever that impacted most on schools' behaviours. And, and the DfE was realising that was the answer to make schools change. So we, we have to bear in mind, having said that, that if we allow ourselves as leaders and as teachers... And, and as communities in general, to simply be guided by the latest wording from Ofsted, we end up like weather vanes just swinging around in the wind and pointing in whichever direction they, they point us in. So on the whole, I don't think that it's a buzzword. I think it's really important. I would say that because it's been you know, a, an obsession of mine for, for well over a decade. But I do think we need to be really careful to find our own moral compass and our own sense of direction and do what's right for our school and stick to that regardless of where that wind blows. And do you think that to put a positive sort of spin on this, it's not a spin, but to look at this positively, as I know you always do, do you think really the changes to, to the Ofsted framework and so forth, whereby school leaders and teachers need to report meaningfully on how they're enriching their curriculum is... Um, rather than it being an extra chore, it's license to continue doing and to do more of the things that, that motivate us really, to, to do all that augmenting and supplementing of the national curriculum, isn't it? Is it license to actually do that more? Because you need to, you need to um, show it. You? It is, uh, it is, and, it, and potentially it could be a very enriching experience for schools. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that the danger is, initially when, when Ofsted put the first draft of the framework out, it, was, it seemed that they were going to shift away from an emphasis on test results towards this, that the curriculum was going to become more important than the test results. And, and I think there's been a bit of bartering there between Ofsted and the DfE because what's actually come out is, a, is an, an unhappy mix between the two, um, where I think heads are being put in quite a difficult position in which they're still expected to deliver the same level of results but they're not expected to be taking the measures they needed to do in order to get those results in the first place. So if, if a child's been taken out of maths and English for intervention, then, you know, that would, uh, sorry, taken out of art subjects or PE subjects for intervention for maths and English, Ofsted would frown upon that now. Or they're frowning upon a three-year GCSE course, but they're still expecting the school to get the same results at the end of it. And I think that's an unhealthy tension for schools. It is, and one can never divorce the idea of curriculum from from assessment the elephant in the room the ugly elephant in the room um mm. because it's always going to affect it isn't it and maybe that's another for another discussion that we we can have but i'm sure in all the work that you do in all the schools that you visit here and abroad when talking so much about curriculum inevitably you're going to be talking about assessment too aren't you because uh, it's always going to affect it um mm. it's always going to affect our ambitions and our plans um because of the way that we're ultimately measured your excellent pathway course is entitled A Curriculum of Hope. And I know you've authored and spoken a lot about a curriculum of hope. Um, and it's such a lovely, interesting phrase. I wonder whether you could just expand on what that means for you and perhaps summarise some of the areas that you've covered uh, in the course. Yes. Um, well, I think especially now, the situation schools are in now um, demonstrates the need for hope to be inherently present in our schools. And sometimes I think 
one of the things we do as teachers uh, in moments of panic and perhaps leaders as well is try and make people feel like the efforts they're making in the present are worth it because of some future outcome. So we say to children, don't we, if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll get good test results. If you get good test results, you'll get a good job and then you'll have a good future. Children, but also adults, find, that, find it quite hard to find the motivation to do something now that will improve in the future. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about lockdown biscuits and, and, <laughs> and all that kind of thing. We all know that it would be better for our future if we stopped eating the biscuits now. But even as adults, it's really hard to conceptualise. So... <laughs> The curriculum of hope is in the present. It makes the learning uh, inviting to the children in the present. It makes the learning have its own worth within the present. And to do that, it, we have to find this sense of um, real, realism and application to the real world. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. So it, it's built on that foundation of learning should be inviting for children in a present, and it should be about the children's well-being in the present. Um, but, you know, we then have to deal with the, the realities of the job that not all learning that children are asked to do in schools is immediately applicable to the real world or is immediately uh, accessible to them. So we have to look at other aspects of motivation there. So when I've been working with schools, our starting point and the, the curriculum that I've written with schools is never the same in, across two schools. It's always ideally placed within their particular school context because I don't think we should be buying an off-the-shelf curriculum I don't think that's hopeful I think in, in some way it's it's the opposite of a curriculum hope but what we do need to do and what I do with the schools is we build on the same five pillars so effectively we're building foundations for planning forward uh, and those five pillars I call them the five C's Two of them are, will, will resonate with people who know the Ofsted framework. So coherence is one of the five C's. And coherence, to my mind, um, and it's a word we've been using for a long time, is the journey that children have when they start in early years and they leave, whether it's at 16 or 18 years old, has there been a development, a progression of their understanding across that time span? So we, we have particular fractures in the school system at transition points, transition from early years into year one, from year, key stage one to key stage two, key stage two to key stage three, and so on. So making sure those transition points are secure and also the things that Ofsted do talk about, progression of knowledge, progression of skills, progression of big ideas and concepts. Uh, the, second, the second pillar is, I called it credibility, but I kind of regret that now. When I was writing the book, I think I might have been feeling a bit defensive and I called it credibility. I think I should have just called it content. It should have been a little bit more neutral. Um, and that's the knowledge. And I think we would all, you know, after the last 10 years of debates over knowledge and skills and all those kinds of things, I think we're all pretty securely sure that knowledge matters. I don't think we're all running around saying they can just Google it and there's no point in having knowledge in the curriculum anymore. Else, We kind of make ourselves redundant and that's not a good thing. So the credibility or the content of the curriculum is, is about a choice to an extent. I know when you come to GCSE and A-level, the content is pretty much provided through a syllabus, but at the rest of school levels, we do have a great deal of choice in, in what we choose. And we have to be really careful that we don't fall into the trap. And this is what teachers often do when they're planning. They sit around a table with a big piece of sugar paper and marker pens, and they write something like World War II or whatever their topic is at the moment. And they brainstorm absolutely everything that could link to that course. And if they're not careful, they can come up with enough content to last for two years. And what they end up with then is a very atomized rush through where no understanding is secured um, and they don't get through everything. And they leave themselves open to the possibility that an inspector or somebody is going to walk into their room and say to them, um, you know, say to the children, name Queen Victoria's children, because it's an objective that's in a curriculum document somewhere. And no one's actually got around to teaching that yet. So we've got to be really sure that our content is um, weeded out 
if you like, so that the things we think are really important are in the curriculum document and with it we, we securely route them. And that's that will link to your school community, it will link to the, the starting points of your children, it will link to your school values and ethos, it won't just be what's in a national curriculum document. And then the other three, which I think are just as important, but perhaps get less of a mention uh, in the framework, but, but certainly I think sit in the hearts of many leaders and many teachers, are creativity, uh, compassion and community. Um, and the creativity is not about whacking in some arts activities, um, you know, or if you're in a primary school thinking, oh, we're doing the Romans, we'll make a mosaic, and that's the creative bit ticked off. It's a state of mind. Uh, it's a habit of mind. And I think it's a hopeful state of mind, because when you're in a creative state of mind, you have the fluency to take knowledge and to apply it to an unfamiliar context. And the more you practice that, the more adept you become at living with uncertainty and living in changing uncertain times so it's far more than just unleashing an artistic spirit it's actually a human capacity to cope with change and uncertainty and to find yourselves in those pits of difficulty where you have you know a vague idea but you can't quite yet see how it's going to turn out and we need to place children in those spaces quite a lot Compassion, I think schools are pretty good, generally speaking, at um, saying to or, or exposing children to situations in which they're expected to demonstrate their compassion towards others. So we read books with them or we introduce them to PHSE topics in which they're expected to demonstrate that. But I'm not sure we always consider how compassionate our curriculum is to children. So I mentioned earlier, you know, the, we know for a fact that um, sporting activities, physical activity, artistic activity is good for people's mental health. We, we saw it in lockdown, didn't we? You know, it's, it's one of the ways of just releasing that tension. But too often we take children out of those activities to give them extra interventions in English and maths. I mentioned that before. Um, equally, I think we have to focus, if we're really thinking about creating a compassionate community, we have to focus on congruence. And congruence is where the behaviours and attitudes of the adults match the expectations that the adults are placing on the child. Um, and that's, you know, something we, we could talk about in 40 minutes on its own, but I'll, I'll kind of push past that. And then the community is... A combination of three things really it's it's what I've sort of called cultural capital but they've kind of misnamed it really I don't think they meant cultural capital in its original sense unless they've suddenly become radical socialists but I think I think what they really meant was cultural literacy and it's the access children have to the kind of language and experiences that perhaps are um well, let's face it, middle class culture might just take for granted. So access to museums and, and galleries and so on, but it, equally it could be a walk through a forest, a trip to a beach. And what that does is make it as important for children to have those entitlements to experience as entitlements to knowledge. And so that's one aspect of community, but there are another two. The, the, the second one is tapping into the expertise within your community. Um, and if you look at Ron Berger's hierarchies of audience, he talks about at the top of those hierarchies of audience that encourage children to give their best to their work are audiences who are capable of critique. So if your children in design technology are making some kind of model of a floating farm to tackle a problem of flooding in Bangladesh, for example, then get somebody in who is a horticulturalist or an architect or somebody who works, you know, for a water aid charity. Um, are those people in your community, could they come in? Because having that professional critique really heightens uh, a child's motivation and also gives them access to real world information and networks. And then the third one is, is about the community in terms of the children being of service to the world. Um, and when they can make a positive contribution to their community, they feel empowered to change it. And I think that's really important, um, especially in today's world. Mm. Well, you mention um, the word community a lot, actually, whenever we speak. Mm -hmm. And when, we, when I had the privilege of working with you that day uh, back in the summer, uh, making your course, 
uh, community came up a, a lot. It's important to you, isn't it? And I wondered why, why you devote so much time and attention to, to community. I think it's because we have this, I guess it's turned into a bit of a buzzword of social mobility. Right. And nearly all our conversations in schools seem to sit around the idea of closing gaps mm. between the advantaged and disadvantaged children, social mobility, you know, leaders are measured on it. Progress 8 is supposed to be uh, linked to it, although obviously there are problems with that. And, and I think we don't, we don't consider what that is enough because... Yeah. We, and I, maybe it's because I grew up in a town like Burnley that I saw, you know, well, a town like Burnley, it was Burnley, uh, that, that was decimated. Now I live in Oldham, a similar kind of town that has lost its own industrial and manufacturing heart and has left a great deal of, of havoc in its wake. Um, and what we tend to t say to those children is if you get an education, you pass your test, you can get out of here. You can go to university and you can go and live in, in a great place. <laughs> and, and we end up effectively creating a kind of fractured identity for children who might have felt proud of their communities initially. Know, but, in, yeah, but increasingly, it, they're hollowed out. Yeah. And so I think it's really important in, in all schools, wherever they are, but particularly in disadvantaged areas, to be tapping into the community and bringing expertise into the community with not an aim of, but the possibility of rebuilding that community from within, that those children see it as equally beneficial for them to stay and build than to escape and go. Um, and I, I suppose it's that personal experience and seeing that within my own communities that sort of led me down that route. And I'm going to sneak in another question, if I may, actually, um, uh, because I was so struck um, in your introduction in Pathway, so struck by this brilliant metaphor, and we chose to film it, did we not, at a running track. And I wondered, I mean, I, I, we haven't prepped for this at all, but I just wondered if you wouldn't mind, just for two minutes maybe, just um, talk us through your brilliant analogy of the, of the different lanes and how there isn't equity there and how it's a frustration for you. Do you mind? Yeah, of course. I mean, I have to be, I have to be honest here because I, I put it into the Pathway uh, documents, but I didn't say it in the actual film, but I have to give this man credit for, right. um, for, for this idea because this is Mick Waters' book. Uh, it's called Thinking Aloud on Schooling, um, and it's an excellent analysis of, of where right. education is at. And, um, and I think what what he talks about at the beginning of this book, and I elaborated it on it uh, in the Pathways document, was the idea that we have an education system at the moment that places children on a running track at the same starting point. We don't have staggered starts. We don't say, oh, this child's almost a year older than this child, therefore we need to put them in a different lane. We don't say this child has access to lots of books at home and their parents are going to pay for personal tutoring, so we need to put them in a staggered lane. We set them all off at the same point and then just expect the children who are further behind to run faster. And then we layer onto that conversation things like, if only we were more resilient, if only they had more grit, if only they had a growth mindset, um, perhaps they'd make it into this middle lane. And then that even ignores the fact that, you know, the children who are on the inside track want to protect that position. Certainly, you know, maybe not the children themselves, but their parents have a vested interest in protecting that position because we have an exam system which automatically cuts a third of them off regardless. They could all run and they could all finish at exactly the same time, but we'd still have to cut a third of them off at the end. So head teachers, leaders, teachers are working within almost an alternative reality, a parallel universe of, of expectation compared to the reality of what we do. So, uh, but I think what we have to do is to think, what are the things that make a difference? What are the things that help children across that line? And it's more than extra teaching, it's vocabulary, it's access to reading, it's access to the world, it's access to networks, uh, the Gatsby benchmarks for career progression and careers education. And it's those things, those are the things that will make a difference. Because if a child leaves school and doesn't even know how to, um, who to contact or how to get work experience or how to fill in an application form and do an interview, those kinds of things make a massive difference. 
if your parents have a mate who's a CEO of a company and they'll give you an internship, you don't necessarily have to be able to navigate those things. So we need to be thinking about where are, the, where are all the staggered starts that we can put in place in spite of the fact that nationally we haven't got that in place. All right. Quite right. I thought it was such an important point to make, and I really enjoyed that. And it's in your introduction to the Pathway course, which is great. So what advice might you give um, to, to school leaders now for steps that they may take in the, in the days and weeks ahead um, to move forward with hope, whether it's to do with curriculum or community or whatever? But what sort of takeaways might one share now? I think, I mean, I think, there are, you know, it's easy for me sitting here in my nice sunny office, not having to go into school and, and get the call that you've had a positive test and you've got to track and trace your entire school community. Now, you know, it's, we, 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 we've got to bear in mind that head teachers are in an unfathomable level of complexity at the moment. But I'd say if you can make that headspace to just walk around your schools and think, where are these five pillars? Where's the compassion? Where's the creativity? Where's the community? As well as, I think we're all pretty focused on the coherence and the content already, but um, where are those things being evidenced? Where are they taking place? Where can they be enhanced? And that is just kind of taking the temperature of your school. Um, looking, Looking for that word congruence, you know, are are our behaviour policies, our expectations of children congruent with the behaviours we're exhibiting towards them? Is there mutual respect? Um, you know, those kinds of things, because children very quickly pick up on those fractures uh, in, in our schools. Um, and I think we have to move towards uh, a sense of collaboration rather than competition within our schools and across our schools. Imagine how much easier the last year and a half would have been if, um, well, year, this last year would have been, but I'm thinking ahead to this upcoming exam period. If schools were in clusters, networks of cooperative self-evaluation, peer-to-peer evaluation, because we could have had moderating of mock exams, we could have had moderating of children's work, we could have put forward community CAGs, but because we are in a situation where we've learned to compete with each other, the idea of reaching out to a competitor school and moderating across our schools would seem alien. So I think those bridges need to be built. I think, I think schools locally need to start connecting together much more. And then audit your parent body. What jobs do they do? What hobbies do they have? What contacts do they have? What can they offer to us? Um, you know, thinking about that so that when you do, we do come out of the other side of this, you know, you have got, you're starting to build those uh, ecosystems, those networks across your community where the relationship between the school and the community is a bit more symbiotic. Absolutely. Absolutely. So important right now as well. Um, Deborah, it's been such a pleasure working with you on Pathway. Um, I wondered cheekily, really, whether you could maybe share just some of the reasons why you were happy to, to get it. And you did seem happy to get involved in Pathway. And it was lovely um, that you were uh, uh, able to give up so much time to write your course. What was it about Pathway that particularly resonated with you? I'm keen to, to know. I, do, I turned down a lot of work, I'll tell you this. I do. Because I feel like I need to work in enabling environments and I'm drawn to enabling environments uh, in schools and, and, you know, with partner organisations. And it seemed to me that the ethos of this was enabling. It wasn't about um, testing and judging and uh, training people. It was about opening up conversations, collaborations, networks. And I, I imagine, and again, like I say, I'm not walking in the shoes of head teachers at the moment, but I imagine it can be a really lonely job at the moment um, and a frightening job where your day-to-day -day decisions have consequences that you should never really have had to, con to be thinking about. But being part of a collaborative organization, having a shared language and shared experience, I think is one way of, of maintaining hope. And I, and I was definitely drawn to that ethos. When yeah, I think that's, that's very much the spirit of what we're trying to do here, actually. Um, they're not, as you know, they're not a collection of masterclasses uh, mm -hmm. delivered at you. Um, they're much more roundtable discussions, inclusive kind of courses and things that, um, that you, can, you can share your views on and, uh, and connect with others over. And these webinars and things, we're doing many of these webinars and podcasts. So I think, I think, I think you're right about the community piece and the networking. I think it's um, 
very reassuring as well, actually, to have that. Um, and on that vein, actually, we've had some really interesting comments and so forth throughout our, our chat, haven't we, actually? And I just wanted to maybe just share a few, if I may, and then uh, lead to a couple of questions, if, if that's okay. Um, and there are some very interesting comments that were um, shared around um, the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring that you've just just been referring to actually and I wanted to give a couple of shout outs if I may so Nick um, oh that's my neck of the woods Suffolk LA that's where I was a primary head so great to hear from you Nick thank you Nick Kerrin in Suffolk um, excellent peer-to-peer -peer school self-evaluation approach led by head teachers now well established and effective in Suffolk so that's really really good and I was lucky enough to experience some of that actually so um, you're right Nick so thank you for sharing that um, there's some great practice going on there uh, from Elaine actually Elaine Huntington uh, primary schools are generally very good at cross moderation and in our area we have uh, up to COVID-19 we had a program of moderation where teachers from about eight local schools uh, were happy to share work and agree on evidence and progress it's good to hear that isn't it that's it's very really good. And I, I think, you know, I, I was I'm just mind, reminded of a conversation on Twitter this week where some secondary teachers were going, it's impossible to cross moderate our work. How could anyone expect that? Right. I was thinking primary schools do it all the time. And it's just another example of how, you know, each phase of education can learn from each other and support each other, I think, there. Because in terms of, certainly in terms of writing, yeah. moderation across schools is, is standard for standard. a primary Interesting from um, Colin, actually, Lofthouse. Thank you, Colin. Some fantastic work going on in Newcastle University with Professor, Professor David Leet et al. on community curriculum building. So that mm. sounds really fascinating. Um, actually. Yeah, I'm doing some work with David at the moment uh, in a school oh, in Wales, and it's the idea of trying to bring in those aspects of authentic learning and uh, community collaboration. Yeah, yeah in terms yeah. of work. Fantastic. Somebody asked the name of... Uh, the ethics of excellence, the, the hierarchies of audience that I mentioned earlier. It's Ron Berger. Ron um, Berger. Berger like yeah. His book, Ethics of Excellence, is really good. And then Leaders of Their Own Learning, um, also uh, a really good book. Leaders to look of their own learning. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, the Mick Waters as well, the Mick Waters book? And Mick Waters is Thinking Aloud on Schooling. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a few requests for the references that you've given, actually. So... Um, Really, really fascinating. Um, my goodness, lots and lots of different comments, uh, lots of really positive comments, especially around the community piece, I think, um, mm -hmm. is a fundamental part of curriculum design, isn't it, I think? Um, we've had a, a question here from Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, Kevin Burnett. How do you get over the idea of a curriculum in a clear and simple way to begin with? I assume we, we, we mean, how do we, yeah, how do you get over the idea? How do you con convey that idea of curriculum in a clear and simple way? That's interesting. Well, yeah, I, th I think the, the word curriculum came from the, the word to run a course, which is where the idea of running yeah. track came from. <clears throat> and I guess if you are running a course, you want to know what the end point is. Yeah. So when I'm talking about curriculum, I talk about it almost as a vehicle. Um, and the, the things you put into the vehicle are the things that are going to be taken from A to B. So when I'm working with teachers, the first thing we'll do is to say, what kind of human being do we want walking out of our schools? What knowledge do they, we want them to have? What attitudes and aptitudes do we want them to have? Um, what kind of future might they be walking into? And what will be helpful to them in, in coping with that future? Um, and we start with that because then you pack the car. Um, you put the things in the car that you want and that's your curriculum whereas if you start with here's a national curriculum or here's a GCSE syllabus or an A-level syllabus you only end up with one or two of those five C's in place and the rest gets left to chance. That's true that's so true that's so true gosh um, thank you yeah I mean completely agree a lot of positive comments um, uh, around your five, five C pillars model and I think that's a it's a, it's a really interesting model isn't it um, thank you for that. Um, can this webinar be rewatched later? I can take that one, actually. Yes, it can. It's uh, absolutely to be there, to be watched on demand. Um, and uh, I'll just check up with my colleagues, actually, before the end of this, as to when that will be available. I'm sure my colleagues on the line will hopefully message me and tell me when that's available and where you can watch it. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, really interesting comments. Um, so thank you for that answer there, um, Deborah. There's, there's one other comment from Kevin, which is, is there any groundwork that has to be cleared first before starting on a curriculum review? That's an, how would you approach a curriculum review then? 
What's an interesting question? Um, well, I, again, it's really hard to say because I don't think it's the same for every school and every circumstance. Um, but I think what we've got to be really wary of is piling more stuff in. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, I don't know if you've come across the work of David Cameron, the Scottish David Cameron. Oh, not the many times, yeah, yeah. He's and he, he often brings up an image of um, a donkey, and this was the curriculum in you know, whenever it was, 1970, and it's just a really? yeah. And then yeah. by now, it's kind of everything's yeah. just piled on. He talks about the breakable plates, and this is a conversation for leaders. If I'm going to ask my staff to add this, I need to take away that. Mm-hmm. Um, And that always has to be the trade-off. So the groundwork is partly in identifying what those breakable plates are. um, Because if we just keep adding, things get dropped. People just cannot carry that load. Um, So that's that's an internal audit, I think, and something that needs to be done at senior leadership level, perhaps in consultation with staff. What's adding a lot to your workload that you think has less value in terms of its outcomes or its impact? Um, and starting from there. Absolutely. Um, we've had we've had several more questions and things actually. So we'll we're going to I'll um, I'll read through all these questions and we'll find some common threads and so forth and hopefully we'll uh, we'll respond to some of those common threads and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm I'm bound to say for those who have asked questions, thank you so much for your questions. Um, and you know what I'm going to say please check out Deborah's course in the Pathway Programme because there's so much more, so much more in that course that addresses a great many of these different questions. And there are also courses on resilience as well, actually, because we've had a few questions about uh, working resilience into the, um, yeah. into the curriculum. Uh, I, mean, I, can, I can just see Sally's question there. Yeah, that's I would, what I was just going to ask you, yeah. I, I, had, I need another 40 minutes to talk I about I know we do, I know. But I, I think it's, it's placing them in dilemma. It's placing them right. within context within the curriculum where they wade through dilemma usually in a fictional context here are two boys in a roof in Bangladesh how are we going to get them off the the local area is flooded how are we going to find their father when we find their father how are we going to reassure his father that he can feed his children because his farm is ruined and as they wade through these problems these tensions these difficulties they find solutions and when that's practiced in a fictional context they start to have opportunities to apply it in a real context let's partner up with a water aid charity what can we do shall we raise money shall we raise awareness um so they are and I, I know that that's a very quick summary, but I no. think reading through contexts is one real way of building resilience um, in children because they're practicing it. They are, they are, they are. It's a brilliant way of doing it. Um, gosh, thank you so much. Really helpful answer, Deborah. Thank you from Sally. So thank you, Sally, for that as well. It's lovely to get these conversations. It's, it's your networking piece that you were talking about, the community right there. Um, thank you ever so much for your time today, Deborah. Really appreciated it. Sorry if we've gone slightly over, but um, yeah. some really, really good questions there. And uh, oh gosh, so much insight. Um, I was very lucky to have made the course with you, to have made the films with you, and to have read your brilliant reading materials. So I, they're highly recommended. Um, enjoy the rest of your day wherever it takes you, whichever school is lucky enough to be working with you. And uh, I hope let's do this again, maybe soon, if that's okay. We'll have another webinar soon, shall we? Thank, Thank you. you for time, it's great to see you. Thanks everyone for taking part. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. So for those who are still uh, able to spare five minutes, um, I'm delighted to just uh, very quickly run through the actual platform itself for Pathway. Um, if you have uh, a few minutes spare, it'd be great to, great to be able to do that. I'm just going to share a few screens of the actual um, Pathway program, which is now available in schools, um, available to, to, to order, to purchase. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a very, very quick run through um, of, uh, of some of the screens, actually. The idea has always been that it is blending professional and personal development together. It's really important to me. I've had 21 years working in schools as a teacher and a leader, and I've seen uh, numbers of teachers um, leaving perhaps earlier than they'd expected, certainly earlier than they'd planned, uh, actually, perhaps even after two or three years. Um, and I understand that, and it can be uh, a difficult job, but I think throwing CPD, professional development, uh, at a problem isn't necessarily um, the only solution, because sometimes it isn't just about what you know, it's about what you can do with what you know, and I think that's inextricably linked to how you feel. And that really is very much not just from the neck upwards, it's about your heart, your mind, your motivation, your ambition, your resilience, your well-being, and all those deep down things that make us 
who we are and they make up the craft of teaching, do they not? Um, so the agency of a teacher, the empowerment of a teacher are as important, well, surely they're more important than their professional capital. Uh, important though that is, it's your agency and your sense of empowerment and your motivation that keeps you in the job at the end of the day and allows you to be the best version of yourself, both for the students in front of you and for your family and friends at home. It's important to look after yourself. It's not a self-indulgent thing to say. So we wanted to try and find a way of doing this remotely so that it's in your time, at your pace, not crammed into a room on a Monday at four o'clock for a twilight, uh, which everybody is, is, uh, is having something you know, delivered at you, but it's actually much more to do with a, prof a personal learning journal that you can actually revisit and come back to and watch these amazing films um, in an evening with a glass of wine or on a Sunday morning after you walk the dog, whenever is appropriate for you. Uh, and you can continue to do that throughout the year and more and more content is being added. While I've been talking, I've just uh, given you some key objectives that we set ourselves there. Essentially, it's about orientating your career, finding out what motivates you, having a sense of your, your skills, so analyzing your professional skills, both as a teacher and as an aspiring leader or as a leader now, um, looking to move on perhaps to another leadership role, and then mapping out, charting your professional roles that you would like to get in your career ahead and those extracurricular targets and goals and experiences and projects that you'd like to set up. That's all part of the thing that keeps you in the job. Certainly when I was a, a, a teacher, it wasn't just the thought of becoming a, a middle leader or a deputy head or a head teacher, uh, which motivated me to get out of bed. It was actually running the sports clubs, running a, a, directing a school play, running a philosophy club after school. It's those sort of things as well, which you can map out that you'd like to take on and on and maybe eventually host some inter-school championships and things like that that keep you, um, keep you plugged in. And then, of course, your health and well-being goals. How are you going to look after your health and your well-being? Because if you don't, then it doesn't matter how much professional capital you've got and how many CPD courses you go on, your well-being is the thing that's going to help you to flourish in the job. So we really looked hard about how we can support all of those three things. It's an integrated program. It's online. It's subscription-based. And it's built on those three areas, orientation, navigation, and reflection. And essentially, those areas are made up of uh, various different elements, Guide to Motivation, which we've written, uh, where you understand the nature of motivation, how to uh, motivate oneself, how to speak to others in the language of their motivation, and how to create your own motivation plan to monitor the deep down things that are invisible but um, are, are very important uh, part of who you are and how you teach. Um, and understanding what makes up the craft of teaching has everything to do with your motivation. I think students need motivated, energized teachers in front of them. But the attrition figures at the moment, the, the number of teachers leaving, suggest to me that a great many teachers are not in that, in that place all the time yet. And I think it's about looking after one's motivation. Uh, and that, as I keep saying, that's not a self-indulgent thing to say, I think. Analyzing one's professional skills using some teacher standards and leadership competencies that we've identified. And you can keep coming back to that self-assessment and keep adjusting it as you progress through your career and your professional currency increases, if you like. Mapping out your career goals, as I said, in the career map. And then a whole suite of online CPE. Notice CPE rather than CPD. It's so much more than CPD. It's continuous professional empowerment. And I can say that because of the way that we built the courses. They're round table discussions. They're not masterclasses where you're being lectured at. There are a whole suite of reading materials with coaching questions for reflection throughout. So it's about what you think, how you feel, and what next steps you're going to take to make things even better. Uh, we're working with universities, we're having some fantastic discussions with universities at the moment about how we can double bubble the work as it were, we're looking to get the content accredited and we've already started those discussions already with some leading unis to look at how we can help you to notch up credits towards master's programmes, obviously one would pay for those credits to be uh, marked if you like, to be accredited, but the work itself would be uh, in the form of the responses you give to the questions for reflection in the courses. And that, that's going to work really well. And so far, the conversations could not have gone better. Uh, and the online community is very important to us. So we're having many more of these webinars. We have podcasts as well. Uh, we're running a podcast called Carpet Time, which is for Pathway uh, users. And we're going to have some exclusive webinars very regularly now for the Pathway subscribers uh, with some amazing special guests like we heard from Deborah today. Um, and the Wellbeing Programme over in Reflection, written by Professor Tim O'Brien and Dr. Dennis Guiney, exclusively for us. Um, about the nature of well-being and critical reflection and how to lead a small research-based project in your school, looking after both your well-being and the well-being of others. 
really, really important, not just now, it's always been important, but perhaps especially at the moment. And the advice is powered by the NAHT, head of advice, Guy Dudley, head of advice at the NAHT for many years, been on the phone to head teachers, school leaders and middle leaders every day. And he is, um, he and his team are piping in uh, PDF content all the time, hundreds of different uh, documents to keep you up to speed with the very latest uh, in policy and practice. And your career portfolio, the My Pathway page, where you can always keep coming back to the courses you were in as a shortcut where you can bookmark and see the progress that you're making through our courses. Lots of different courses being added all the time. We have the first 20 courses that have landed. I think it's 21 courses, actually. And then we have the motivation course and the well-being course in addition to those. And every course uh, has been written by the most amazing practitioners and experts in their field. Um, and I've really, really enjoyed working with the League of Extraordinary Teachers, as we call them. Um, amazing, passionate enthusiasts and very human uh, like us, they champion well-being and resilience and motivation as much as professional knowledge. And you'll see there's a generic list of different titles there and themes to do with leadership rather than just subject specific. It's much more to do with the generic aspects of leading and teaching. Uh, what they don't teach you in training from Omar Akbar is, is a tremendous course and really great fun, as they all are. Really interesting, funny people with lots of interesting, funny anecdotes and things to share about the trials and tribulations, the, uh, the fragilities, and also the successes uh, that we champion in this amazing career. Uh, it's a fantastic career, isn't it? But it's quite nice to be able to sit in a roundtable discussion with others to share when it goes well and share when it doesn't go so well and what we can do about it. So... These are very honest, authentic courses, which I've really, really enjoyed making with the team. Every course is made up of different units and there's a different film in every single unit shot in and around the Manchester region and various other regions um, in lots of really interesting locations. Visually, I think these are beautifully made by our friends at EY3 Media, who is the production company that we've had the privilege of working with. And extensive reading materials, all academically referenced with some tremendous wider reading references in the bibliographies for all of these reading materials that I've had the good fortune to edit and see. And they are, they're, they're, it's proper stuff. I mean, it's really interesting, really interesting stuff to see. Um, these are some shots of the actual platform, which I'm, um, well, I'm like a kid with a new toy. I'm very excited to share these. I mean, it's an amazing platform, beautifully made. Um, these are just some of the slides. You can see the three, three main stages there, orientation, navigation, and, uh, and reflection. Um, it's a partnership which we're very proud of with the NAHT, the union for school leaders, 125 years old, let me say. And um, we, we've worked in partnership from the very beginning, from the very first meeting I had with the NAHT uh, over a year ago now, back in August, actually, uh, last year. And uh, I was uh, so pleased when they agreed to become our partners with this. And we've just, we've built this together. Um, and they've, they've brought so much creativity to this and so much understanding of what school leaders and teachers need uh, and value. So it's been a, a winning partnership and, uh, and it continues to be so. We were lucky enough to have uh, a great slot at the annual conference on Friday. And we'll be speaking again at, uh, at a number of conferences in the coming weeks ahead. So uh, thank you to the NHT for their help with, with what we're doing. Uh, also, we have the orientation piece, as I said, which leads to the motivation guide and the skills audit and the career map. The navigation is a whole suite of different films. Um, and as, as I said, reflection is all about your well-being. It's actually about pausing to admire the view and to reflect, critically reflect and move forward in hope uh, and with confidence and, uh, and agency. Every course has different films and introductions and reading materials, which you can see on the top left there. Very easy to navigate through those different reading materials. And each of them end in open-ended questions where you can write not just one line. That, that box there is live. You can go in and you can write a whole essay if you wish to. It's your own private learning journal. And those questions, as you can see, are open-ended. They're not right or wrong. You're not going to get a score for this. It's about what you think and how you feel. Uh, the motivation plan is based very much on, uh, on Maslow, uh, whether we're motivated by having, doing, or being. And understanding that is so empowering in your role. So I'm really looking forward to sharing the motivation plan with you. If you can, uh, if you, if you, when, you, when you subscribe, you'll see the most amazing, unique motivation plan. And the skills audit and the career map, as I've said, 
And to work with Professor Tim O'Brien has been an absolute delight, um, an absolute champion for well-being and uh, a very senior and experienced figure in the world of well-being with his writing partner, Dr. Dennis Guiney. We're very lucky to have them produce a unique course for us, um, filled with lots of different interesting films, very interesting people to talk to, and some fascinating reading materials to go with it. And the Advice Hub, as I mentioned with Guy Dudley, those are just some of the 12 different categories in which you will find a whole raft of different PDFs, which are constantly being added to and updated to keep you up to date so you don't miss those data submission deadlines, those things that affect your well-being as much as anything else. Uh, keep ahead, keep up to date, keep on track. And there's the dashboard, which will take you back to the latest courses that you've been working on with some shortcuts to the advice hub. So I hope that's uh, been useful. Uh, looking forward to speaking to Pran in, uh, in a few weeks' time. On the 10th of November, we're going to have another live webinar with Pranav Patel, um, absolutely extraordinary thought leader, very experienced senior leader in schools, academic anti-oppression educator and activist, and really amazing. Course. He made a course for us called Diversity, Equality and Inclusion, and he made a series of films and reading materials which have really made me think. They really have. And uh, it's been a joy to work with Pran. So he's going to be a live guest in a webinar in a few weeks' time. 10th of November is the date for that. And we've got uh, some great slots at the National uh, Association of Head Teachers Primary and Earliest Conference on the 12th of November. David Gumbrell is one of the Pathway authors talking about resilience. Many of you will have heard of David. He's been a very experienced primary school head and now an author of the most amazing books on resilience, Lift and Risk and various other books that he's writing. And he's talking about the heads control tower. He loves his metaphors, does David. And uh, he's done a webinar actually, which you can find on the NHT hub where all of these past webinars are stored. He did an amazing webinar with, with me, a, a live discussion about how we support resilience. Hannah Tudor's uh, a very, very successful and, and a really humble and brilliant head teacher of a primary school in Kent, um, turning the school around with her team uh, amazingly into an outstanding school. She talks about strutting your stuff and having professional arrogance. There's an interesting phrase which we wouldn't normally associate would be with teachers, but it's very important to feel confident. So she's going to be talking about that at the conference and, uh, and I'll do a piece on planning for creativity, my absolute love. So I hope that's been useful for you. Thank you for staying so long. It's been terrific to see so many people still with us. Um, do feel free to check out any more information you need on the Pathway Programme at the Discovery Education website. We'd love to see you there. Uh, register your interest or even order it if you wish. Uh, thanks for staying so long. It's been great to see so many people on the call. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And when it comes, have a well-earned rest this weekend. And, uh, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much.